Hi, this is Rod Saunders from Jew and Greek. Today I'm going to start a new segment for this channel called Musical Monday. Um, I'm going to try and do a video every Monday about music. It might be Christian music, it might be secular music, uh, I might be performing, I might be just discussing music theory or maybe interviewing some musician or something like that, but it's going to have something to do with music because music has been such a big part of my life. So I uh, hope you enjoy this and find it interesting. Those of you who are musicians, uh, I believe that you will. Those who aren't musicians, hopefully you'll find something of value contained in these videos. Um, let me just give you a little bit of my background as a musician. Uh, first of all, I, uh, I started on the piano when I was eight years old, and it, it's interesting how that happened. Uh, I was a baseball freak when I was a kid. Willie Mays was my hero. And I played Little League Baseball, and I watched baseball on TV all the time. And uh, my mom and dad found out that kids do better in school when they're, uh, when they're taught music, when they learn music somehow and uh, that the best instrument to learn if you want to study music is the piano. So they had my two older sisters and I, they had us all take piano lessons. So my oldest sister, Sherry, she started on the piano and then a couple of years later, my other sister, Sally, started. And then when I was eight years old, they announced to me that I'm going to take piano lessons. And my response was, I don't think so. And they said, yeah, yeah, you're going to take piano lessons. And I said, I don't want to play the piano. The piano's for sissies. And you have to understand that this was back in the 1960s, okay? It was before everybody had synthesizers and uh, electronic keyboards. Back then, it was basically piano or organ. And uh, I just thought, and, and most kids my age thought that the piano was for sissies. And so I didn't want to take piano lessons. But they wanted me to do good in school, so they wanted me to study music. So I was, they were determined I was going to take piano lessons. And so my dad said, well, look, if you don't take piano lessons, then you can't play baseball. Well, that wasn't fair at all. Dad knew there was no way I was going to give up baseball. So I said, all right, I'll take the stupid piano lessons because I'm not going to give up baseball. I mean, what could I do? I was eight years old. You can't really you know, file a complaint with anybody. So uh, I go into my first piano lesson and Mrs. McPherson introduces me to the piano and she shows me the, the keys. And she says, okay, there's, this is A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. And, and then you start all over. And then she, so she says, okay, so let's review. What note is this? And I said, A, and this, B, C. And then she gets to G, and then she says, okay, what's the key after G? And I wasn't really catching on at this point, so I said, H? She said, there's no H. I'm thinking alphabet, you know. She said, no, there's no H. You start over again. It's A, B, C, and these are octaves. You know, this is this uh, this is middle C. This is the C above middle C, and so forth. So she just starts me on the basics, and I'm like, okay, okay. I, you know, I don't really, I don't really get this, but uh, you know, I'll try. And uh, eventually, I I got the hang of it. I understood what uh, octaves were. I I learned how to play scales. I learned about uh, root position, first inversion, second inversion. Uh, sharps, flats, major, minors, uh, standard notation. I learned all of this stuff. Uh, I took piano lessons for four years and I had a pretty good understanding at that point of the fundamentals of music. And uh, during those four years, uh, we had recitals where you get up and you play for uh, family members and friends. And, uh, and then we had uh, a guild, a G U I L D. A guild is where basically the, uh, you, you don't play for family and friends, you play for piano instructors and they grade you on what you're good at and, and what you need improvement on. And uh, of course, 
when I started off, I was nervous playing for these recitals and guilds. But uh, after four years of doing this stuff, you know, it was old hat and I wasn't really intimidated by it anymore. So uh, I remember my last recital, I was about 12 years old, and I was so sick of the piano at that point. And uh, I just said, you know, let's just get this over with. That was basically my attitude. So I practiced. I was, I was ready. I, you know, I, because my parents were paying for the lessons, they made me practice. So I had to practice like a half hour a day. And after doing that for four years, you know, it really gets old, especially when you didn't want to do it in the first place. But uh, anyway, I remember that last recital. I just, I said, you know, let's just get this over with. And I wasn't nervous at all because I didn't want to be there. I had a terrible attitude. I said, I don't even care if I do good. I, that's how sick I am of playing the piano. I don't care if I do good in the recital. Let's just do it and get it over with. So I got up there and I played my piano piece at my last recital and I absolutely nailed it. It was the best I'd ever done. And a lot of people came up afterwards and they said, man, you were good. That, that's the best you've ever done. And I thought, yeah, I did do pretty good, didn't I? And I learned, I, I realized later on why I did so well. It's because I didn't get nervous. And that was always the problem uh, with me uh, messing up in a recital or a guild is if I would get nervous. But I didn't get nervous this time because I didn't care. And so I learned as a result of that a little trick I can play on myself. When, I, when I'm tempted to get nervous performing in front of a crowd, I'll just tell myself it's no big deal. You know, nobody's going to remember this tomorrow. It's not going to, you know, it's not going to ruin my life if I mess up. I don't even want to be here anyway. And, and I do this little mental trick and it seems to work. I've learned to manage my nerves over the years just by talking myself out of uh, thinking it's a big deal and uh, anything to get nervous about. So anyway, um, when I ended uh, elementary school, I started in junior high when I was 12, uh, I was growing real fast and I was awkward. And I went out and tried to play baseball and I just couldn't hit the ball anymore. You know, these kids were getting bigger and throwing the ball faster and I was awkward and I just couldn't hit the ball. I, you know, I was pretty good in Little League, but I just, I couldn't hit anymore. And by that time I'd started playing golf and I said, you know, I think I'm going to just focus on golf now. I, I'm not going to play baseball anymore. Uh, you know, I still liked baseball, but I was really getting into golf. And so I just dropped baseball and took up golf. And I told my mom, I don't want to take piano lessons anymore. And she said, but you're good at it. And I said, I don't care. I didn't want to do it anyway. I don't want to take piano lessons anymore. And, and she was kind of, you know, disappointed, but... I said, look, the deal was if you can't, if you, if you don't take piano lessons, then you can't play baseball. I said, I'm not playing baseball anymore. So you can't use that as leverage against me. So anyway, I won the argument and she didn't make me take piano lessons anymore. I don't think dad really cared. Dad just, you know, dad paid the bills and let mom, you know, make these decisions. So I didn't take piano lessons anymore. But then when I started in high school, I told mom, I want to take guitar lessons because that was really the instrument that I always wanted to learn to play. So she said, oh, good. Well, I'm, I'm glad you haven't given up on music. And I said, no, I just didn't want to, I just didn't want to play the piano. Uh, so she found me a guitar instructor and I started taking guitar lessons. And uh, the reason I wanted to, uh, to take guitar lessons is because I was trying to learn the guitar on my own. I had these little guitar chord books and I couldn't figure them out. I did, you know, this is, you gotta understand, this was 50 years ago. And uh, it wasn't, it, music uh, instrument, uh, music instructional books were not everywhere like they are today. You didn't have the internet where you could order stuff. I mean, you had to go to a store and, and buy Hal Leonard stuff and and try and figure it out and i you know i just i didn't have anybody to explain it to me and i didn't know what these chord charts meant so i got an instructor and he explained it to me and and once i understood it i thought oh okay i you know i can i can learn all these chords on my own now because i i know what i'm looking at 
So uh, we did the we did the guitar lessons, and my instructor would uh, he would just strum chords, or, or uh, actually I would strum chords, and he would play notes. And so we would do a song like "Home on the Range," and uh, he would be playing. <laughs> And while he's playing out that melody, I'm strumming the chords. And I have to look at the chord chart and then look at my fingers and strum the chords. And then he'd have to stop and wait for me to change chords and get that C down. And then we'd stop again. And then stop again. And that's the way the lessons went. It was really boring. I'm sure it was boring for him because it was boring for me. But uh, anyway, I, I just decided, you know, I don't, I don't really want to do this. All I wanted to learn was how to read those stupid chord books. And I've learned that now. And I don't want to sit here and play Home on the Range. I want to play Smoke on the Water, you know. So anyway, after a couple of months, I told Mom, I don't want to take guitar lessons anymore. And she was like... Stupid kid, you know, he doesn't know what he wants. And she said, I thought you wanted to learn to play the guitar. I said, I do. She said, well, how are you going to learn if you don't take lessons? I said, I'll teach myself. I've got the books. He told me how to read the books. I, I'll learn it. And I think she thought that I was, you know, just, you know, a dumb kid who uh, was thinking that he was better than he was but i was determined i i understood what was going on and and i knew that if i could uh if i could just read those books i would figure out these chords and i would learn to play on my own so i did i sat there every day and i went all through that book hilarious all my basic chords g a c d d7 d minor a minor e minor i learned all those chords that were in the book and then it came to bar chords. Now, bar chords were, you know, a real challenge because you're supposed to hold down all the strings with one finger and then form the chord with the remaining fingers. And at first I said, that's impossible. Nobody can do that. You can't hold all the strings down with one finger and make a chord with the other fingers. But then I started noticing guitar players doing that. And I thought, well, I guess it's not impossible because they're doing it, but I can't do it. I, I've tried, but then I thought, oh, wait a minute now. If they can do it, I can do it. They were beginners at one point. So I just hung in there, and I kept working on my bar chords, and eventually I got to where I could play bar chords in my sleep. So um, I thought, you know, just a couple of months ago, those bar chords were impossible, and now I'm doing it. I thought, if I can do that, I wonder what else I can learn. And that, I've kind of carried that principle with me my whole life. You know, I'm, I'm very optimistic and, and, and positive about when I'm trying to learn something. I can do this. I can do this. You know, I couldn't do that at one point and I'm doing it now. So I'm going to be able to do this, you know, whatever it is, whether it's working with computers or learning another instrument or learning a language or whatever. So um, I uh, eventually started listening to the guys that I wanted to emulate, uh, James Taylor, Jim Croce, Gordon Lightfoot, Harry Chapin, Don McLean, Paul Simon, Dan Fogelberg, and, and uh, let's see, I'm leaving somebody out there, John Denver maybe. Uh, those were the finger style singer-songwriter guys in the 70s that I wanted to emulate. That's what I wanted to do. So I listened to their stuff just constantly, and I got to the, by the time I got out of high school, I could play pretty much anything these guys played, note for note, the way that they did it. Uh, like Time in a Bottle, uh, Jim Croce's song. It was just a matter of listening to it over and over and finding where those notes were on the guitar and then practicing, practicing. James Taylor's Fire and Ray was... James Taylor's guitar playing is kind of tricky uh, with the timing at times. So it was challenging, but I, I got to where I could do what these guys were doing by the time I was 18. 
And, and I was thinking, you know, I used to think these guys were really good guitarists, but now I'm doing everything that they do. So either they weren't as good as I thought, or I'm pretty good at this. And I pretty much decided, you know, I'm pretty good at this. I was getting kind of cocky, you know. And then one night I saw Leo Kotke on TV. Now, if you don't know who Leo Kotke is, uh, he's a legend in the world of fingerstyle guitar. And, uh, I mean, he doesn't even have to sing. He'll just sit there and play the guitar and blow you away. He was on some variety show. It might have been Ray Stevens or Smothers Brothers show. I don't know, one of those shows back then. And he played, a, he played a tune called Bean Time. And I, to this day, I can't play Bean Time. But uh, it goes something. I know how it starts. It starts off like... Something like that. And uh, he just blew me away. I mean, my jaw dropped. <laughs> I had never seen anybody do anything like that on the guitar. And uh, all of a sudden, I didn't think I was hot stuff anymore. I realized how far I had to go on the guitar. But it opened up a whole new world for me. I, I suddenly realized the possibilities of solo guitar. And so I started buying Leo Kotke albums. I started listening to Chet Atkins and Jerry Reed and all these fingerstyle guys. Eventually, I got into the Wyndham Hill guys, William Ackerman and, and the legendary uh, Michael Hedges. Michael Hedges did for acoustic guitar what Jimi Hendrix did for the electric guitar. He just pretty much reinvented it. And then later on, I started listening to uh, flamenco guys and, and then classical guitarists. And uh, I just, I subjected myself to so many different styles and techniques and influences in various musical genres. And so over a 40-year uh, period, uh, I came uh, full circle because I, I left out this part on the piano. I played a lot of Bach and I hated Bach. I hated Bach on the piano. Just da da dum dum dun 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 da 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 dun dun dun. I hated it. Bach didn't actually write for the piano. He wrote for the clavichord. The piano came along late in Bach's life, uh, but uh, the clavichord is, is you know the, the strings are plucked. You hit the key, but it plucks the strings instead of hammering. So you get this kind of a percussive plectrum sound, which actually works well on the guitar. So. Uh, even though I hated Bach when I was young, when I started really getting, getting into classical guitar in my 40s, I came full circle. I started playing Bach on the guitar and I fell in love with Bach. Uh, his, his stuff is just perfectly suited. Even though it wasn't composed for the guitar, it's been transcribed for the guitar by many uh, classical guitarists over the years and it works great. And so I, I love playing stuff like... <laughs> can't play it very well on a steel string. But uh, I've played Bach at weddings and uh, in restaurants, uh, at civic centers, uh, played uh, even at church some. And uh, so it, it was just interesting going full circle, starting on Bach on piano and then coming back to Bach 40 years later on classical guitar. Uh, so, over the years, I've played in numerous worship teams in different churches. I've, I've uh, performed in coffee houses. I even played on a hayride one time. Uh, and I've picked up other instruments over the years. I, even though I didn't touch the piano for like six years, uh, I started playing the piano again when I was 18 years old. But I, I wasn't playing Bach and, and Mozart and Chopin and Liszt. I was playing Billy Joel and Elton John. That's the stuff that I wanted to play on the piano. And I picked up the banjo and uh, the bass. The bass is easy. If you can play the guitar, you can play the bass because it's just like the, it's the same tuning as the top four strings on the guitar, only it's an octave lower. 
Uh, and then uh, I picked up the mandolin. I thought, well, the mandolin's similar to the guitar. It's just tuned a little different. It's a little bit smaller. So uh, I bought a mandolin, learned to play, and then somebody told me one day, hey, if you can play the mandolin, you know where the notes are on the violin because they're tuned just the same. I said, really? And I grabbed a fiddle off of the wall in the music store and I played around with it. I said, what do you know? I know where the notes are on the violin. And I got this idea. The light bulb came on and I said, all I gotta do is learn how to use a bow and I can play the violin. Well, easier said than done. I messed around with that thing for years before I finally decided to take lessons because technique is everything on the violin. You can, you can have lousy technique on the guitar or the mandolin and, and sound okay, but boy, you, you really need uh, instructions from a, a trained professional on the violin. So anyway, I took lessons for a couple of years on the violin and uh, got to where I could play good enough to perform. And so over the years, I've, I've played six different instruments. I, I've written and I've, I've sung. I'm not a big singer, but I've done some singing in restaurants for tunes that I feel like, you know, are suited to my voice. And uh, I've, uh, I've taught and off and on, I've taught for 30 plus years in, uh, in different uh, schools or just on my own. And uh, I, I love music. I love all different styles of music, different techniques, uh, different, uh, different artists that I've listened to. And, and when you listen to a lot of music, it's just like putting money in the bank. You know, you just keep on putting all of this knowledge and familiarity with music in your brain. And then when you sit down and you try to figure stuff out and, or write a song, you got a lot of influences to draw off of. So uh, I want to I want to get back into uh, writing music, and uh, I want to start playing the violin more uh, when I've when I've got time to practice. That's the thing on the violin; you got to practice an hour a day to sound decent. So it, there is a, a real demand there on your time. But I love the violin; I want to improve on that. Anyway, that's basically my history here. Uh, I hope uh, I hope you enjoy these videos. And uh, let's see, I'll, I'll play a little something as we go out here. This is a, this is a little tune uh, that Leo Kotke did, one of the few Leo Kotke tunes that I've learned. It's, it's called The Fisherman. Well, I was going to play a Leo Kotke tune, but as I started playing it, I totally messed it up. So I decided I'm going to play something else here. Uh, I'll do a little Simon and Garfunkel here. I'm sitting in the railway station, got a ticket for my destination. Mm -hmm. On a tour of one night stands, my suitcase and guitar in hand. And every stop is neatly planned for a poet and a one man band. Homeward bound, I wish I was. Homeward bound, home where my thoughts are escaping, home where my music's playing, home where my love lies waiting. Silently for me